In this lab, I want to talk about the anatomy of digestive system. You know that your digestive system is made up of two parts. One part is called digestive tract. The digestive tract is uh, a tube which starts from our mouth cavity, as you see in this picture, and ends in uh, anus. The digestive tract has different parts. First, we have our mouth cavity. After that, we have a region which we call it pharynx. And the part of pharynx, which is associated with our digestive system, is called oropharynx. Then we have esophagus, which is the muscular tube which pass our cervical region and, and our mediastinal cavity, perforates the diaphragm, and enter our abdominal cavity. Then it makes a J-shaped tube, which we call it a stomach. And after the stomach, you can see a small intestine. The small intestine is made up of three major parts. First, we have duodenum, then we have jejunum, and the last part is called ileum. And then we have large intestine. Our large intestine is composed of cecum, then we have a very long colon. We can divide our colon to the ascending part, transverse part, and descending part. And after that, we have sigmoid or S-shaped colon. Then we have rectum, anal canal, and anus. These are the different parts of our digestive tract. Each of these different parts have their own specific anatomy and histology because each of them should perform a specific task for us. Your mouth cavity should make the food smaller and mix it with the saliva and make bolus. The bolus pass the esophagus and enter the stomach. In the stomach, we have mechanical and chemical digestion of the food. And after that, we have a soupy-like um, content, which we call it chyme, and chyme enter our small intestine. In the small intestine, most part of absorption of nutrient take place. And then the material enter the large intestine. In the large intestine, we have formation of feces from the waste product and fibers, and also we have a small amount of absorption, like absorption of vitamin B and K, like absorption of water and some parts of electrolyte. And then we, you know that the feces or a stool is created and we can do defecation voluntarily under our control. And we need to potty train our kids how uh, to uh, control their defecation. But besides the, rest, the, the digestive tract, we have some digestive accessory organs. These digestive accessory organs are uh, our salivary glands, which are located around our mouth cavity. We have parotid salivary glands, sublingual and submandibular here. You have teeth. The teeth can help you to chew uh, the food and make your food become a smaller in its pieces. And we have tongue, which can help a sensation of taste and also help movement of the bolus to the back of our mouth cavity. You can see a liver. A liver is the largest organ, uh, accessory digestive organ, which we have. It's located in the right side of our abdominal cavity. And uh, it can make different enzymes, it can do detoxification, it can make bile for us. So we have many, many functions for the uh, liver and we will learn about it in the lecture completely. You can see a green sac which is suspended from the liver and we call it uh, by, I'm sorry, gallbladder. And we have a biliary system which is located between our liver and gallbladder. And I will talk about it a little bit later uh, for you. And besides uh, the liver, we have the other structure which you can see it here and we call it pancreas. The pancreas uh, has two important functions. 
It can do endocrine and exocrine secretion. The endocrine secretion is secretion of insulin and glucagon, which can control the level of sugar in your bloodstream. And the exocrine function is making different enzymes, which can digest your food and help absorption of the food in the small intestine. So this is a very quick overview on our digestive system. And now on the models which we have in the lab, I want to talk about each of these parts specifically for you. Here you can see the mid sagittal section of the head and neck. In this mid sagittal section, we talked about the nasal cavity, the nostril and the quana, which we have, the conchi of the nasal cavity and the neatus, the sinuses, which can help warming air and humidify air, the pharyngeal tonsil and the opening of eustachian tube and the region of nasopharynx completely. And today I want to talk about the oral cavity for you. Our oral cavity, as you see here, is a start with our lips. Our lips is composed of a skeletal muscle inside, which is covered by the skin from outside and the mucous membrane from inside. The muscle which we have in our lips is called orbicularis oris. And from 2050, you know that this muscle can make the purse shape a structure for our lips. After that, number two is the teeth which we have, and number three is our tongue. You can see the roof of your uh, mouth cavity. The roof of our mouth cavity is actually the floor of our nasal cavity, and it's made up of hard palate and soft palate. The hard palate has the <coughs> palatine process of maxilla, and horizontal plate of palatine bone. And the soft palate uh, is the membranous part, which is ends with the uvula or uvula at the end. And you can see the region of oropharynx, which is number eight here. In the oropharynx, you know that we have palatine tonsil and lingual tonsil, which is located on the base of our tongue. And number 10 is called the laryngopharynx or hypopharynx. This region is very important in its physiology because this region should control uh, the uh, entrance of the bolus into our esophagus and entrance of the inhaled air in our trachea. We talked about the respiration before. I told you that when we want to inhale, the epiglottis should go up open the entrance of trachea and the air can go to our larynx and trachea. But when we want to swallow something, this epiglottis should come down, close the entrance of larynx and the bolus can only go to our esophagus. If we are nervous, if we cry and eat, if we shout and eat, if um, we are very excited at that time, this epiglottis uh, become confused. Uh, and it doesn't know it should come down or go up because the nervous um, um, system of these parts is very, very uh, complicated. And then we may choke. So these are the important things which you need to know about this model. In this picture, you can see some of the salivary gland. We have two types of salivary gland. One type is called uh, extrinsic and major, and one part is called intrinsic and minor. In this picture, you can see two of the major extrinsic salivary gland. One of them is this one, which is the largest one, and we call it parotid, and the other one is number two, which is located beneath our mandible, and we call it submandibular gland. So you can see the parotid and submandibular gland 
in this picture. These glands uh, have ducts and the ducts can um, help the secretion go to our mouth cavity. Again, in this picture, you can see the parotid and the submandibular salivary gland. And beneath our tongue, we have sublingual salivary gland. It's located beneath the lung. Sub means beneath. Because of that, we call it sublingual salivary gland. In this model, uh, in this part of our model, actually, you can see the esophagus, the last part of esophagus and you can see the stomach. As I told you before, the stomach is a J-shaped tube. And we have a valve which can connect our esophagus and a stomach together. This valve is called cardiac sphincter, or we can call it gastroesophageal sphincter. This valve can coordinate in terms of bolus to our um, uh, stomach. Our stomach has two curves. One curve is located um, toward the medial line of our body and it's a smaller, number five. We call it lesser curvature. One of them is located laterally and we call it greater curvature. So our stomach has lesser and greater curvature as you see in this picture. Inside the stomach, we have four major regions. The first region, which is immediately after the esophagus is called cardia. After that, you can see one blind pouch on the left side of cardia and we call it fundus. This is a dome-shaped region or blind-ended region. The majority of our stomach is called number four or we call it body of the stomach. And after that, as you see here, the stomach become more narrow become thinner and make number seven, which we call it pyloric region. So our stomach has cardia, fundus, body, and pyloric region. And after the pyloric region, you see that the stomach become very narrow. And this narrow part is the junction between the stomach and the duodenum, which is the first part of a small intestine. This valve is called pyloric sphincter. After that, <clears throat> you can see the first part of the large, the small intestine. This is duodenum, and our duodenum can receive secretion from our gallbladder and pancreas, and I will talk about this system later for you. Here you can see the leaf-like structure, which we call it pancreas. Our pancreas, as I told you, have endocrine secretion of insulin and glucagon to regulate the level of glucose in our blood, and it has one exocrine secretion. The exocrine secretion is secretion of pancreatic juice full of enzyme to our duodenum. In our pancreas, we have a major long duct, which is yellow, I'm sorry, white here. This long duct is called main pancreatic duct. And this main pancreatic duct brings the secretion of the pancreas to our duodenum. We have one short thin duct, which is located above the main pancreatic duct, and this duct is called accessory pancreatic duct. So you can see main pancreatic duct and accessory pancreatic duct 
here. And inside our small intestine, we have many folds. These folds can increase the surface area. And when the surface area increase, we can have better absorption. These folds, as you see here, are called plica circularis, or we can call them circular fold. So these folds inside the small intestine are called plica circularis, or circular fold. In this picture, we have the frontal section of the stomach, and you can see inside the stomach. Here you have the esophagus. I told you that between the esophagus and the stomach, we have the sphincter here, which we call it cardiac sphincter or gastroesophageal sphincter. When the bolus wants to come down from the esophagus to the stomach, this sphincter needs to become open. After that, you can see the cardiac region. This region I told you that is called fundus, the dome-shaped region. After that, you can see the body of the stomach. And when the stomach become narrow, we call it pyloric region. Between the pyloric region of the stomach and our duodenum, we have the other sphincter or valve, which we call it pyloric sphincter. This pyloric sphincter um, doesn't let uh, the content of the stomach come to our small intestine easily. The content of the stomach should become like soup and then it can pass this sphincter. Due to this um, thing uh, and this physiology, we need to keep the um, material in our stomach between three to five hours until the mechanical and chemical digestion of our stomach makes soupy-like structure, which we call it chyme, and then this chyme can pass the pyloric sphincter and come to our duodenum. You can see the lesser curvature and the greater curvature in this picture too. When you look at the inside of the stomach, you can see many longitudinal folds in the stomach. These longitudinal folds are called rugae. And this rugae allow the stomach to become expanded to fill up with food. So the, all of these longitudinal folds are called rugae, while the longitudinal folds, which we have in our uh, sorry, the circular folds, which we have in our small intestine, are called plica circularis or circular fold. This is the other model of a stomach which we have in the lab. You can see the esophagus here. After that, you can see the cardiac sphincter. This region is called a cardia. This region is called cardia. This region is a dome shaped part and we call it fundus. After that, you have the major part of the stomach, which we call it body of the stomach. And the last part is called pyloric region of the stomach. In this picture, you can see the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. And at the end, you can see pyloric sphincter, the sphincter which we have between a stomach and a small intestine. Inside the stomach, all of these longitudinal folds are called rugae. And in the duodenum, all of these circular folds are called plica circularis. 
In the lecture later, I will talk about these two red structures for you. One of them is called peptic ulcer and the other one is called duodenal ulcer. These are the problems which we have in our stomach and the first part of our small intestine. Uh, and this is due to the function of the acids uh, and the deficiency of enough mucus in the wall of our uh, stomach and duodenum. I will talk about it for you completely later. Before I talk about this picture, I want to show you the biliary system. Look at this picture. In this picture, you can see the liver. Our liver normally has four parts or four lobes. And in this picture, you can only see two of them. One of these lobes is called left lobe of the liver and the other lobe, which is the largest lobe, is called right lobe of the liver. The other lobes, which we call them caudate and quadrate, can be seen from the inferior view of our liver and we cannot see it in this view. Your liver has different functions. It can make different proteins, different enzymes. It can do detoxification of all drugs and toxins which come to our di digestive system. Uh, but besides all of these functions, our liver can make bile. And the bile is important for digestion of fats and lipi uh, lipids in our uh, digestive system. When the bile is made in right and left lobe of the liver, some ducts can convey this bile to our gall bladder. All of you pay attention. From the left lobe, we have a duct, which we call it left hepatic duct. From the right lobe, we have the other duct, which we call it right hepatic duct. Then right and left hepatic ducts combine together and make common hepatic duct. So left hepatic duct from left lobe of liver, right hepatic duct from right lobe of liver combine together and make common hepatic duct. You can see a duct from our gallbladder, which we call it cystic duct. Then cystic duct, and common hepatic duct combine together. And these two ducts can make one duct here, which we call it common bile duct. Common bile duct and pancreatic duct from our pancreas merge together and make a duct here, this one, which we call it hepato-pancreatic ampulla. And this hepato-pancreatic ampulla open to our duodenum. So what happened here? From our right lobe, we have right hepatic duct. From the left lobe, we have left hepatic duct. 
they combine together and they make common hepatic duct. Common hepatic duct and cystic duct can make common bile duct. Common bile duct and the pancreatic duct make hepatopancreatic ampulla. And this ampulla open to our duodenum. This duct, the hepatopancreatic ampulla, actually carry the bile and the pancreatic juice together in our duodenum. We call it biliary system or biliary tree. And you need to memorize all of these ducts in order completely. Now, in this picture, you can see the inferior view of our liver. You can see left lobe, which is located in the left side, right lobe, which is the largest and located in the right side. You can see one lobe here, which is number three. We call it quadrate lobe. And one lobe, which is number five, and we call it codate lobe. So right, left, quadrate, and codate lobe of the liver. Then you can see this is the location of gallbladder. From the right lobe, you have number eight, which is the right hepatic duct. From the left lobe, you have number nine, which is the left hepatic duct. Right and left merge together and make common hepatic duct, which is number 10. The common hepatic duct and the cystic duct of gallbladder combine together and make number 12, which we call it common bile duct. Look at here, the common bile duct is a long duct. It comes down, combined with number 13, which is the main pancreatic duct, and make number 14, which we call it hepatopancreatic ampulla. And this ampulla open to our small intestine. Pay attention, the main pancreatic duct merge with the common bile duct. But the accessory pancreatic duct, which is a smaller and thinner, open to our duodenum directly. So this is open to our duodenum directly, but the main pancreatic duct and the common hepatic, uh, sorry, common bile duct can make hepatopancreatic ampulla and then open to our small intestine. And the other thing which you need to know here is the hepatopancreatic ampulla has a valve here, which we call it, let me bring it for you here. hepatopancreatic sphincter and it can open to our uh, small intestine. The other name of hepatopancreatic ampulla is ampulla of water. So both names can be used. The other name of this sphincter is Adi sphincter. Let me write the name for you. The sphincter which we have here is called Adi sphincter. After the stomach and uh, the pancreas and liver, you need to know about your small intestine. Our small intestine has three major parts. The first part is number one here, and this uh, part is called duodenum. After that, we have jejunum, and the last part, which is the longest part of our small intestine, is called ileum. 
Are two genome is about 25 centimeter, the J genome is about one meter, and the ileum is about two meters. And you know that your small intestine is the primary site of absorption, and we have a small amount of digestion in the small intestine too. After the ileum, you can see one valve here, which is number six. This valve can <clears throat> control the entrance of material from a small intestine to large intestine. And this valve is called ileocecal valve. This is a valve between ileum of the small intestine and the cecum of the large intestine. In the large intestine, we have uh, different parts. The first part of the large intestine is this part, and we call it cecum. As you see in this picture, the cecum is a pouch-like structure. And attached to the cecum, we can see a verbinous structure which we call it appendix. And after that, you can see your colon. This part from this region, your colon starts. First, the colon comes up. Number seven, we call it ascending colon. Then this ascending colon can make a flexure or it can make a curve, which we call it hepatic flexure. We call it hepatic flexure, flexure because it's located beneath our liver. After that, you have the next part of your colon, which we call it transverse colon. It comes from the right side of our um, abdominal cavity, to the left side. Beneath the spleen, it makes the other flexure, which we call it a splenic flexure. And then the colon comes down. This part is called descending colon. And at the end of the colon, you can see one um, S-shaped structure here, which we call it sigmoid colon, and then it opens to our rectum. So our colon has ascending part, which is in the green color. Then you can see the hepatic flexure, transverse colon, and a splenic flexure, descending colon, and the sigmoid colon, and after that we have rectum. Pay attention, the ileum and the ileocecal valve is located between cecum and colon. So the small and large intestine are not connected together end to end. The ileum open uh, between cecum and colon, as you see in this picture. The other thing uh, which I want to show you in this picture is uh, the small structures which we have, the small pouches which we have in our large intestine. One of them is labeled with number 12. And I make the others for you with green color. These a small pouch-like structure are called hostra. In the hostra, we have a segmental um, absorption. And I will talk about it in the lecture for you completely. Uh, the other structure which I want to show you is uh, the strip which you can see it with number 13. These strips are uh, three in their numbers 
and we call them tenia poli. Actually, they are the thickening of uh, longitudinal muscles which we have in the wall of our large intestine. After the colon, you can see number ten, number one, which is the rectum, and it's the straight tube which come down. Then you have number two, which is the anal canal, and number three is the anus. The anus is protected by two sphincters. One of these sphincters is number four. We call it internal anal sphincter and we have it on both sides. This is a smooth muscle. The other one is number five. This is the external anal sphincter and this is the skeletal muscle. So you can see a smooth and a skeletal muscle here. The function of a smooth muscle is involuntary while the skeletal muscle can work voluntary. When we want to do defecation, first this internal anal sphincter should be open and then under our control, we can open the external anal sphincter and we can do defecation. In this picture, you can see the liver model. You have right lobe of the liver in this view, which is the largest lobe, and number two is the left lobe. Between number one and number two, we have a ligament in a living person, which we call it falciform ligament, and this ligament can attach the liver to the wall of our abdomen and also a part of diaphragm. In this view, you can see the right lobe, the left lobe, the quadrate lobe, and the caudate lobe. In this picture, you can see the right hepatic duct, the left hepatic duct, they merge together and make common hepatic duct, common hepatic, and cystic can make common bile. Duct. This is the section of inferior vena cava and this vein which you can see come out of our liver is the hepatic vein. Right lobe, left lobe, quadrate and caudate. You can see the gallbladder here, the inferior vena cava. The right hepatic duct and left hepatic duct, they make common hepatic duct, common hepatic duct, and cystic duct can make common bile duct. In this picture, you can see the hepatic vein, and this is the hepatic artery. The real cadaver, you can see the mid sagittal section of head and neck. You can see the palate, the hard palate, and soft palate. The first part is palatine process of maxilla, and then you can see the horizontal plate of palatine bone. This is the soft palate, and from the soft palate, we have uvola or uvola, which is suspended from the roof of. Um, sorry, from the end of our soft palate and roof of the mouth cavity. You can see the mouth cavity or oral cavity. This is the tongue and you know that the tongue is attached to our hyoid bone inferiorly. You can see number seven, which is the oropharynx and the number eight is the epiglottis. And number nine is called the laryngopharynx. And number 10 is our esophagus. You can see the voice box in the anterior part. The false and true vocal cords are visible here. And this is your trachea. 
In this picture, it wants to show you the salivary glands. You can see number one, which is the carotid salivary gland. Number two is the submandibular. And number three is the sublingual salivary gland. And number four is the tongue. Here you can see the thoracic cavity and in the center, uh, if I want to draw it for you, this is your thoracic cavity. You know that you have two pleural cavity on both sides and in between you can see the mediastinal cavity and your esophagus is located in the mediastinal cavity, which is number one. Uh, in this picture, you can see the diaphragm, which is number two. This is liver in the right side of our abdominal cavity. And number four is the stomach in the left side of our abdominal cavity. This is the abdominal cavity. You can see the diaphragm. You can see the liver. The gallbladder is suspended from the liver. And uh, you have the stomach here. From the greater curvature or the large curve of our stomach, we have one membrane which come down and cover our intestine completely. This membrane is called greater amentum. So the greater amentum can cover our large intestine completely, a small and large intestine. This is like the apron, which come down from the greater curvature of the stomach and uh, cover all of our intestines from anterior. Greater amentum. We remove the greater amentum and we can see more details beneath it. You have number one, which is the diaphragm. Number two is the right lobe of the liver and this is the left lobe. And I told you that between right and left, we have falciform ligament, which you can see it here. Number three is the gallbladder and number four is our stomach. Number five is the small intestine. And all parts of our intestine have a one membrane which attach them together and attach them to the posterior abdominal wall. We call it mesentery. And this is fan-shaped mesentery, fan-shaped membrane. So this number six is the mesentery of a small intestine. And uh, you can see uh, number seven, which is the ascending colon. Number eight is the hepatic flexure. Number nine is the transverse colon. Number 10 is the splenic flexure. And number 11 is the descending We remove the stomach and the small and large intestine, most parts of them. And you can see diaphragm, number one. Number two is the right lobe of the liver. Number three is the gallbladder. You have number four, which is the right hepatic duct. Number five is the left hepatic duct. Six is the common hepatic duct common hepatic and number seven, which is the cystic duct combined together and make number eight, which is the common bile duct. Number nine is the leaf-like pancreas and number 10 is the duodenum. In this picture, number 11 is the ascending colon. The transverse colon is cut here. And you can see number 11, which is the descending colon. Then I told you that it's become S-shaped, the sigmoid colon. 
and uh, between uh, the small in intestine and the large intestine, this is the location of the valve, ileocecal valve, because this is the last part of the ileo. And number 13 here is the cecal. The valve is located between cecal and ascending colon. In this picture, uh, this is the male sagittal section. Here you can see the rectum. Number two is the anal canal. And number three is the external anal sphincter. And this region is called anus. This, I want to show you this picture just to see the location of urinary bladder, which is located anterior and the rectum, which is located posterior. This is the urinary bladder. And then we have a long urethra in male, which enter the penis, and then the uh, pee can come out of uh, the external urethral orifice. And this is the testis, which is located in the scrotum. And in the last chapter, I will talk about it completely for you. This is the female mid-sagittal section of the pelvis. You can see the rectum, the anal canal, the anus, and you can see the external anal sphincter here. Here is the uterus, and this is the vagina. Here you can see urinary bladder and short urethra. And you will learn about all of these parts later this semester. This is uh, the uh, separated stomach. You can see the esophagus. You can see the cardiac region, the fundus or dome-shaped region. Number four is the body of the stomach and number five is the pyloric part. This is the lesser curvature and here you can see the greater curvature of the stomach. And you can see the duodenum here. Number six is the pancreas. And number seven is the common bile duct, which is the result of fusion of cystic duct and common hepatic duct. This is the frontal section of the stomach. You can see the esophagus cardiac sphincter. This region is called cardia. Then you can see the fundus. You have the body of the stomach, the pyloric region, and this is the pyloric sphincter. You can see the lesser and the greater curvature here. All of these longitudinal folds in our stomach are called rugae. After that, you can see the duodenum. And in the duodenum, you have many circular folds, which are plica circularis. Besides these structures, you can see number 10 here, which is the common bile duct. You can see number 11, which is the main pancreatic duct. The common bile duct and main pancreatic duct can make hepatopancreatic ampulla. And this ampulla open in this foramen in our um, small intestine, which uh, is protected by a valve, which we call it Adi sphincter. This picture wants to show you the biliary system. This is the liver, right lobe of the liver, and you, this is the gallbladder. Number three is the right hepatic duct. Number four is the left hepatic duct. They combine together and make common hepatic duct. Common hepatic and cystic can make common bile duct. This is the pancreas. The duct of the pancreas is called main pancreatic duct. And common bile duct can make number 10, which is the hepatopancreatic ampulla and open to our duodenum. Number 11 
is our duodenum and you can see plica circularis in the duodenum. Right lobe, left lobe, falciform ligament, and gall bladder. This is the left lobe, this is the right lobe. Number six is the codate, and number five, which is like a square, is called quadrate lobe. And number four is the gall bladder. You can see number seven, this is the inferior vena cava. We have the section of hepatic portal vein here. And this is the common hepatic duct. And number 10 is the hepatic artery. This is about the anatomy of digestive system. Next time, I will talk about the histology and microscopic structures of each of these parts for you completely.